Congressman, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, another example of the deep space communications that we just reestablished with Voyager 1, which is outside of our solar system, approaching interstellar space, and it came back to life. And lo and behold, we got it. And where it's located so far away at the speed of light, the transmission takes 22 hours. And we just reestablished that. What, if you don't mind my asking, Mr. Administrator, what caused that to come back into, into force? They, <clears throat> again, these wizards, they do all kinds of things. Okay. And this is a spacecraft. It's a very old spacecraft. All right. Voyager 1, I think it was launched back in the 70s. And Amazing. Uh, so it is still perking. Wow. Okay. Thank you. That's great information to know. Uh, the uh, uh, gentleman from uh, Florida, Mr. Frost, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, Administrator Nelson. <clears throat> With the goals of returning Americans to the moon and aiming for Mars, the Artemis program has private partners in all 50 states and over two dozen in Florida's 10th Congressional District, which is my district. Artemis is a significant contributor to NASA's $4.7 billion economic impact on Central Florida alone and has partnered with the University of Central Florida Go Knights on several research projects to support lunar landing and living. This is why my colleague Congressman Posey and I are leading a bipartisan letter to the CJS Appropriations Subcommittee calling for additional Artemis funding to overcome delays and technical complications. Mr. Administrator, with all the challenges of such a complex and cutting-edge program, what can NASA do to minimize further delays in the Artemis mission cadence? Well, first of all, we can have congressmen like you that help us make an additional request. Uh, understand that we're not going to launch until it's ready. And that is because safety is our first. When, when we put humans on an explosive bomb called a rocket, we're going to do everything possible uh, to make sure it's as safe as possible, realizing that everything is cutting the edge of the envelope that we do. Uh, but especially when humans are in the loop, we're going to make it uh, that much more safe. So we're on schedule next year to have four astronauts circle the moon and check out the Artemis spacecraft. We are under contract with SpaceX for September of 26 to have a lander of which we would go into lunar orbit and they would transfer in and go down to the surface for six days. Uh, obviously, if that lander is not ready, we're not going to fly at that time. But uh, that is the schedule and that's what the contract calls for. Thank you. And the most recent success um, in the partnership of NASA and private space industry um, was a soft landing on the moon's south pole um, as part of the Commercial Lunar Payload uh, Services Program. How does the work of the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program complement um, the work of the Artemis program? They are scouts for us, just like sending scouts out into the wilderness. Uh, so, for example, one of them that is going on intuitive machines at the end of the year uh, is going to start digging in the South Pole to see if there is water underneath the surface. If there's water and it's in enough abundance, then we have rocket fuel. And overall, what, what can we as members of Congress do to support the nationwide economic and scientific impact of NASA's work, especially when it comes to the Artemis program? I mean, we know that I think any day now China will be sending, uh, will we'll do the first mission to bring back um, things from the far side of the moon. We know this is uh, funding these programs and it's the best na uh, in the best interest of our national security and uh, the work that we do. But what can we as members of Congress do? There's the old saying, the president proposes and the Congress disposes. You're in it. You're our partner. You make it possible for authorizing us to do this stuff. 
and then appropriating the means by which to do it. And uh, lastly, can you briefly describe some of the scientific highlights of the commercial missions um, in terms of the commercial lunar payload services program? Oh, yes, sir. For example, uh, this last one, uh, it was an intuitive machine. It caught its leg on a rock as it was coming down, and it tipped over. Uh, the fact that it tipped over, it didn't have its antenna pointing in the right direction to receive. Uh, but we, it was still faint enough that we could get enough to know that it was alive. There were six NASA experiments on board. Now, this is an incredible story of the chairman of the full committee, Hal Rogers, in his district as a university, Morgan State. They have big dishes that can support the commercial program. But in this case, the CLIPS, uh, the CLIPS wasn't able to communicate. They didn't have enough power uh, from their commercial communications. But Morgan State was uniquely positioned that it could also communicate with our government deep space communications that had the power in order to receive that weak signal. And therefore, most of the objectives of the mission were successful with a connection there made through Morgan State. Uh, that is a, an example of a daring do that suddenly uh, the NASA scientists and the commercial community and a university were able to figure out real time. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Administrator, and uh, yield back.